Can people hear me now? You think? <laughs> I think that's good. Okay, I'm gonna try this again. Sorry. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm just gonna start that over again. So my name is Teresa. I am a member of the Freedom Road Socialist Organization and I will be hosting this panel today. Um, so I'm just gonna give you guys like a brief um, rundown on what May Day is, and then we're gonna have three fantastic speakers. Um, our first speaker is going to be Bryn, um, who is a student organizer, and then our second speaker is going to be Nick, who is a labor organizer, he's a teamster working at UPS, and then we're gonna have Mariela Mendoza speaking, who is an organizer um, with Uplift and the Micro Mutual Aid. Um, so yeah, we're gonna start there. And then, oh yeah, and then the last thing we're going to do is we're going to watch a solidarity video from the, um, sorry, <laughs> um, a solidarity video from Fronte Popular, um, it's an Italian communist organization, and then we're going to open up everything for questions, um, I'll look at the comments in, underneath the, like, the live video. Okay, so um, just a little bit of background about the Freedom Road Socialist Organization. We are a revolutionary socialist Marxist-Leninist organization here in the United States. Um, we are very active in the labor movement, the student movement, uh, the movements, uh, the national liberation movements, and other um, struggles to improve the conditions of the multinational working class. Um, so our main goal is to build socialism and to have a revolution because we have the perspective um, that that is the only way we're going to change the oppressive conditions um, we see here um, under US imperialism. So yeah, and our basic strategy is, you know, we want to, you know, build up the multinational working class and bring unity with the multinational working class with the oppressed nations. Um, so just a little bit of background about May Day. So like millions around the world, we honor Ish International Workers Day or May Day. Um, that is on May 1st, it's May 2nd, but you know. So May Day has particular significance to the working class. Unlike um, Labor Day, which is kind of like May Day's lukewarm sister, I would say, um, May Day commemorates the struggle of the working class. Um, yesterday and then that invigorates the struggle of the working class today. Um, you know, it's not just paying respects to people uh, like to workers that make money for capitalists. It's about our struggle um, for liberation, right? So May Day has its origins in the struggle for the eight hour workday back in, in the 1980s. And um, a lot of the struggle is um, concentrated in Chicago. Um, so in 1867, um, it was actually in, I believe, federal law that people, workers um, were entitled to an eight hour work day, but you know, those laws were not being implemented. So labor activists um, set to fight for the, that eight hour work day that was already a law, but wasn't being respected. Um, so in 18, I believe 1884, um, or 1886, um, like thousands of workers fled to the streets in Chicago, um, peacefully trying, um, protesting for the eight hour work day and for also like better child, like, you know, all the child labor conditions and stuff. Um, and there was a lot of police repression. Um, if some people are familiar, I'm gonna put a link down later about the Haymarket Massacre um, in which you know, multiple people were murdered by the police and then uh, people were wrongly convicted and executed. Um, and this was all a part of like repressing the labor movement at that time. Um, and this, this um, commemoration of 
like May Day is not just about the past. You know, we, we understand that working people and oppressed people are still repressed by the police. You know, we still do not have the rights and power that we deserve, um, and we are alienated from our labor. Um, so what we're talking about here is very relevant to what was happening in the 1880s because we're continuing the struggle, um, you know, as like working people and oppressed people. Um, in connection to COVID, you know, we're seeing again that like working people and black and brown communities are being hit the hardest. Um, here in Salt Lake City, uh, our highest concentration of coronavirus cases are happening in Rose Park and Glendale, which is a largely uh, Latinx, um, black and brown community, right? Um, so, um, and also as well as like the Navajo Nation down south, um, you know, we are seeing just a huge number of cases, not enough supplies going to those communities. Um, and this is no accident. Um, this is kind of how our country is set up. You know, it's not set up to uh, accommodate and empower people, working people and oppressed people. So um, our, all of our speakers are going to be talking in more detail about the work that they do and then, um, you know, kind of talking about what we can do as working and oppressed people um, to, you know, fight for better conditions, fight for our liberation. Okay, so I am going to start with um, Bryn. So Bryn is a student organizer. They're gonna be talking um, about the work that SCS has been doing um, prior to um, the pandemic, but also how they are continuing the struggle um, for improved conditions for students. Give me one second to transition this real quick. And you're on. Can you make yours? Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, I'm Bryn, and I organize with Students for Democratic Society, or SCS. Um, just a little bit about the organization. Um, we're a radically progressive student organization. Um, we organize mostly at colleges across the United States. Um, we have a national organization that's all over the United States, and then here locally, um, we organize at the University of Utah. Um, so we have been staying, we've definitely been staying active during this pandemic. Um, Pre-pandemic, uh, we, as a national organization, were planning to do a national week of action around DACA. Um, the DACA decision is, well, I don't know now, I guess, with the pandemic, but um, was kind of scheduled to be decided in June. Um, the Supreme Court was going to make a decision about whether Trump's decision to end DACA was constitutional. Um, and so we um, decided to do a week of action where we would do call-ins and local rallies. Um, of course, with uh, the pandemic, we had to change our plans. We still wanted to hold the week of action because this decision on DACA is so, so important. Um, so we did the call-ins. We called in to Mitch McConnell three times. Uh, his staff was not happy about that. So we know we did some good because we <laughs> annoyed the staff a little bit. Um, and then we also held local call-ins here to uh, the mayor of Salt Lake, Mayor Mendenhall, and our federal senators. Um, so National has definitely still been still been doing a lot of stuff um, and we've just been learning how to you know switch from doing in-person events to more like call-ins and stuff like that and actually um, calling in is something we've done before not in a pandemic because it's a good way to do a national action anyway so um, but yeah so just a little bit more about local SDS what SDS in Salt Lake City has been doing um, before the pandemic we were doing a mental health campaign um, the University of Utah's Counseling Center is underfunded right now. Um, they, their staff, their understaffed um, national organizations have set like guidelines for the like correct um, counselor to student ratio for universities and ours was like very, <laughs> it was not up to standards with that ratio. 
Um, so people had long wait times for appointments. When students were going for appointments, they'd have to wait four to five weeks to just see a counselor, which is ridiculous. Um, and they also just are, are raising the rates on the counseling uh, sessions. Um, and uh, this was this was interesting. So this, this is pre-pandemic. This was in the spring, uh, in the fall. Um, it was interesting because uh, what we were doing in the fall um, was characterized mostly by the election and by the Democratic primaries, because that was happening. Everybody, like, I know we've all, like, kind of forgotten that we're in election year because of this pandemic, um, but that was, that was what the conditions um, were like in the, in the fall. And um, we, uh, it was really exciting for us because we saw a lot of college students getting really, um, not just excited about, like, elections, which um, elections in the United States are, like, not democratic, um, and it's, uh, you know, it, it, yeah, it's good to vote, but, like, it's not going to really get things, or not really change things like that. Um, but, like, students were getting radicalized and saying that, like, the system, yeah, is, like, not working for students, it's not working for working people, it's not working for oppressed nationalities. Um, so uh, this has been really exciting um, with uh, Bernie being the spotlight and just bringing a more radical tint to uh, U.S. politics. Um, but yeah, but then everything changed uh, after the pandemic. Um, what we did is um, we suspended our mental health campaign um, just because of changing conditions. Um, and the University of Utah actually did a lot of things in response to the pandemic as well. Um, some of the things they did were better than some universities and some were worse. Um, like some universities like waited weeks like to tell students anything like they just wouldn't tell their students anything which is ridiculous and then some universities are already like voluntarily um, giving their administrators pay cuts um, to, to, to help pay for um, student stuff that students need so um, the University tells kind of in the middle of that not that great but not that bad um, so classes went all online um, including the summer classes, and there's talks about maybe putting fall classes online, um, which is actually very difficult for some students. Some students do well online, and some students just don't. And the thing is, is that when people signed up for their classes last fall, um, they didn't expect to have them all online. Um, so, and the university um, is not doing enough to accommodate students who just can't do online classes. And of course, um, some students just don't have access to online classes because they don't have access to computers or Wi-Fi. Um, and uh, the other thing they did that was really crazy, after a couple weeks of saying that students could stay in their dormitories, um, all the students were kicked out um, with like four days notice. Um, except there were some, exception, some exceptions for international students, homeless students, foster students. Um, but uh, every, most people um, were kicked out, um, evicted, even though the university denies that it was an eviction. Um, and I was, at the time, I was living in a house with a bunch of queer people um, and uh, who were very young. A lot of them were freshmen. And to get an exception to be kicked out, you had to fill out a form. And it's not, it, it's not fair to ask a bunch of like young, like 18, 19 year olds to like self-identify that they need to like stay in their housing, because some of them did have places to go, but um, their families weren't very supportive because they were queer. And some, and some uh, of my roommates, my former roommates, were talking about how they had to go home to parents who worked in healthcare. So if we're talking about keeping people safe, um, sending students to go home, um, like at the time to Illinois, when Illinois was a big hotspot, to New York City, or um, like that, you know, and the, the school, of course, says that they want to keep people safe, but they do a lot of things that actually puts uh, students at risk. Um, so we uh, had two call-ins about that. Um, I posted floor, flyers around the dorms for the call-ins. I got a little bit of trouble for that because we're not really supposed to do that. And we talked to the dean of students who, you know, um, they still kick us out. But um, it was important to organize around that because it was affecting a, a lot of students. Um, one thing that was really awesome to see, and the SDS actually didn't have a part in, it was just a student, a student made a online petition to petition for credit and no credit classes. So instead of getting graded with like an academic like letter grade, you just get credit or no credit. 
Um, and they started a petition for that online. They got almost 800, eight, sorry, 8,000 signatures, which is a large percentage of the undergraduate student population. And um, after that, the university did allow people to sign up to have the classes be graded as credit, no credit. So that was really awesome. That, um, and that was something that students did and a win uh, by students and for students to help them out during that time. Um, so uh, just in response to the university's um, like response to this uh, pandemic, we started a new campaign, and this is the campaign we're having now. Um, I think somebody is going to be posting a link to our uh, to our online petition for hazard pay and student refunds. Um, our current campaign, we want hazard pay for workers that are still working on campus, because right now the University of Utah does have people still working on campus, um, and they are not receiving hazard pay. And some of these are students. Some of these um, job positions are student workers. I was a student worker on campus just a month ago, and I made like $9.25 an hour, which first of all, if you're asking us to pay like tuition, you should be paying us much more than $10 an hour, um, but now they're being expected to work on campus um, with inadequate, they're not always given adequate um, personal protective equipment, and they're not getting hazard pay. Um, so we really need hazard pay for on-campus workers, and we also need students, uh, run refunds for students. So one thing the University of Utah did was they extended the withdrawal date, um, uh, I think a month, a couple weeks or a month, um, after classes went online so that students who could not take online classes could withdraw. Um, and that was great. Um, that needed to be an option, but they are not offering refunds for these uh, classes that students have withdrawn from. So again, these students who withdraw, they're not getting a grade, they're not getting credit at all, um, and they still have to pay tuition, which is ridiculous um, in the face of a pandemic. Like, students are going to be um, hit hard by this because <laughs> their school is interrupted. Um, a lot of students have jobs in places that, like, are closed now, like restaurants and stuff, and they're being expected to pay for tuition for stuff that they're not going to even get. Um, and then we're also demanding refunds for about half of the student fees. The, the school is still charging us for student fees for stuff we can't access, like our Student Life, life Center, the Rec Center, um, and just different things around the school that because the school is literally shut down and we're not on campus, we just don't have access to, so we shouldn't be expected to pay for that. Um, and to organize around this, uh, before the pandemic, we would do a lot of in-person stuff. We would do rallies, um, we would fly around campus, we would do uh, sit-ins sometimes, which the administrators loved when we sat in their office and banged on drums all day, that was fun. Um, but now we have to be a little bit more creative, and um, so we've been using more social media, uh, we've been doing more call-ins, which has been a little bit difficult because sometimes assistants aren't even in the office um, so we've actually now we've moved to doing more email ins because um, pro tip if you're organizing a call in or an email in um, call ins might not get to the to the actual like secretaries that you're trying to call um, but emails will because people get emails from their home phone um, so that's been something we've been seeing more success from um, and we've been holding virtual meetings. Um, and we have done a car protest, like some uh, places have. I know there's been a lot of car protests in um, Michigan, I think, but we're, we're, that's, that, we're thinking about it. We'll, we'll let you know. Um, we're also planning on adding a demand about accountability um, with the $18 million that is coming to the University of Utah from the CARES Act. So the CARES Act is the same place where hopefully uh, y'all got a $1,200 stimulus check from and that um, act also is giving money to universities. And Betsy DeVos, who we hate, but um, she said that at least half of this money that's coming to universities must be used in direct grants to students. So what's really um, important for us uh, now and in the future is to make sure that the university is held accountable to that and that the actual, that half of that $18 million is going to uh, direct student grants and that it's not going to things like uh, the new police station or because um, they've been giving a lot of money recently to the university police department. So we've got to make sure that money is, is being used correctly. Um, and then also we're bringing back our mental health 
um, demands into our campaign. Um, this, of course, is an like, extremely high stress time, um, and students need, well, everybody, um, everybody needs access to counseling right now. Um, one of the things that's weird with students' access to counseling is that there is a licensure issue where um, therapists cannot give counseling on the, over the phone to somebody who's not in the same physical state as they are. Um, and so uh, we are uh, checking in again with the university, making sure they said they were going to work on that and make sure that, that students do have access to counseling because that's something, again, we pay for in our student fees. Um, so we are checking in with that again just to make sure that they are actually working on that because counseling is something that is, is super important at this time and any time. Um, just looking to the future a little bit, uh, fall is kind of uncertain, classes might be online again, um, and if they're not, there will be new like standards to follow uh, at the school. Um, so we really need to be making sure that um, if classes aren't in person, that the, that the university is providing adequate protection for workers and students um, during the fall while they're taking classes, while they're while workers are cleaning classrooms and preparing food, um, stuff like that, we really need to make sure the university is providing protection for them. Um, and we also uh, need to make sure that the university uh, is uh, providing more help to international students, especially. Um, international students are having a really hard time right now. Um, some of them, especially with visas, so some of them, um, their visas are expiring, they have to travel to their countries of origin, but you know, travel is restricted right now. Um, so they're having uh, a really hard time right now, especially, um, yeah. Um, what we're gonna, what we're probably gonna be seeing um, in the future is, uh, and we've already seen that schools are complaining about losing money right now, um, which is ridiculous because um, schools are super, <laughs> Schools are super wealthy. They have, um, our school has an endowment fund that is invested in the stock market. So it's fine. It's totally fine. And there's a bunch of rich people that always going to school. So they should not be complaining about money right now. Um, but we're, we are definitely going to see austerity measures come in. Um, and when uh, cuts happen to programs in schools, the cuts always happen to things like ethnic studies and like humanities courses first. Like that's, that's what we're going to be seeing. We need to make sure that that does not happen. Um, and earlier in the year, we had actually won a demand um, in our counseling campaign. We were demanding more counselors, and the school said that they had opened up more counseling positions. So they had not hired these counselors, but they had opened up more positions. I don't know for sure, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that the university probably, like everywhere else, has a higher increase right now. So that means that um, the counselors that they would be hiring that they wouldn't be hiring counselors. And as I said before, like mental health is super important. So we have to make sure that um, the university is still like spending money for students where students need it. And one of those places is the counseling center. Um, yeah, so as, as students, um, some things that we can do um, starting now and in the fall is that um, we can hold chop from the top campaigns. So if students are worried about money, um, they, I know they pay, uh, at the University of Utah, they pay their football coach, I think it's $3 billion a year, and I think it's, I'm pretty sure it's billion with a B, okay? Like, a lot of money. Um, our football coach does not need to be making that much money. Um, so, chalk from the top, uh, our administrators don't need to be making that much money, um, and their, their, uh, we just need to be cut first before student programs and student resources. Um, and then we need to continue fighting for workers and students on campus. Um, and I just want to say one more thing because um, it's been in the news a lot lately that the economy, right, is like tanking, it's bad for everybody. It's bad for everybody but Amazon, okay? And so we also have to remember that when um, schools, especially public schools like the University of Utah, where we get a lot of funding from the government, um, when schools talk about um, like making cuts, and doing austerity measures, we have to remember that if we actually taxed rich people in this country, and if we taxed corporations like Amazon, we'd be fine. Amazon's doing really well right now because everybody is shopping online, um, and there's there's absolutely no reason why working people and students need to suffer when there are corporations making like billions and trillions of dollars and not even getting taxed on it. So 
Um, I just want to end with that. Um, and thank you so much for having me on. All right. Thank you, Bren. Um, so one second. Okay. So we are going to have Nick Godfrey, Godfrey from um, the UPS Teamsters to um, speak. So give me one more second. Transition. Okay. Okay, Nick, you are on. They can't hear you. Uh, I can hear you here, but for some reason you are not being heard over the live stream. Um, yeah, I don't know why. It shouldn't be any different for, between you and Bryn. Um, okay. Maybe there's like... So you're not muted. Okay. Okay. is a problem. Oh, 
Huh, weird. Hey, can you check if you can hear Nick? Is this, they can't hear him. Nick, try talking again. Yeah, I can hear him. Weird. Um, let me see. Just stay on. Me? Yeah, I'm here. Hey, I think Nick, I think you should. I think you should stay on, um, and just uh, we'll just try to figure it out. Yeah. Maybe we should just go to Ella. Let's try going to Ella and see if that works. Yeah. Are you ready, Eddie? Ella? Ella? Okay. It's fine. Yeah, So what do you usually do? I just have this one, like both of them. Do you have to select it or like put it on top or something? No, it doesn't make a difference. Well, it's not... This is... no. Can you... No. Wait, how do we get on?
In retrospect, that test stream last night might have been a good idea. No, I am not muted on Zoom Hangouts. Yeah. Um, it just makes it so difficult because there's such a there's such a delay between uh what is that let's see this is no okay again let me know in the comments if you can actually hear me it's all that noise you're on my end now but uh Who has sirens going past their place? Now. You can? Yeah. Okay. I'm being told that uh, we've got audio back. Uh, should I go ahead with where I was starting? All right. Sweet. Um. So I want to talk about the current conditions of the labor movement. Um, I want to talk about uh, some of the opportunities and threats that uh, the labor movement is facing at the moment. I want to talk about some demands that we've put forward as the FRSO and how to uh, carry out a campaign to make a change in your workplace. Um, so first of all, uh, the state of labor, labor movement is, of course, very weak. Uh, it's been in decline for over 40 years now. Um, we, and that's largely due to, um, uh, a strategy of class collaborationism that has, um, long, um, reigned over labor, uh, and it's resulted in, uh, declining union, uh, membership and, and militancy, the, the frequency of, of strikes, strikes and actions. Um, we started to see that turn around a little bit uh, last year with the mass wave of teacher strikes, which were incredibly encouraging. Um, and we've started to see uh, a big militant uh, labor response uh, within the last uh, couple months uh, as a result of the crisis. Um, the website Payday Report uh, tracks uh, worker actions, and there's been over 150 wildcat strikes carried out uh since the beginning of march which is uh, a really incredible really encouraging sign um we're seeing a typical response to the crisis from our sellout uh bureaucratic leadership uh my own union boss james p hoffa jr um who's been in power way too long in the teamsters has uh written an op-ed in the usa today along with three other uh major labor uh, labor leaders um, saying that this was a stress test for capitalism, but um, capitalism is, is holding up and it, it's resilient. And they praised a number of um, horrifically exploitative businesses, such as um, General Motors, who just seven months ago were kicking striking workers off their health care plan in order to break a strike. Um, so it's clear that uh, we, we can't rely on the uh, union bureaucrats anymore today than we could before this crisis. Uh, we also see a complete lack of response from regulators, um, little to nothing from OSHA, from the NLRB. In retrospect, the test stream last uh, night might have been a good idea. Okay, but hang on just a second. I'm having audio from the stream bleed over. No, I am not muted on Zoom Hangouts. Sorry about that. Okay. Where was I? Um... So we're seeing an increase in union buying uh, from uh, employers. Um, we're seeing contract suspensions, especially in the public sector. We're seeing a general application of shock therapy, uh, which is capital taking advantage of the crisis in order to uh, consolidate, uh, become more centralized, become more streamlined. 
And, and that's always at the expense of uh, working in oppressed people. Um, we're seeing an increase in automation, a uh, breakdown of very fragile supply chains. Uh, we're very likely looking at more layoffs and recession. Um, a lot of businesses that are closed now are going to stay closed. Um, we're, and that's going to result in a lot of these companies asking for greater concessions in coming contract negotiations. Uh, we're probably going to face a lot of death and loss, uh, personally, uh, comrades and coworkers. Um, and that's going to lead to a lot of demoralization. Um, we're seeing bosses learn how to run leaner operations, uh, um, as they downsize in response to the crisis. Um, they're having a lot of people who are being, uh, doing the job of two or three people. Um, and they're unlikely to hire those two or three people back if they think they can get away with um, just putting greater workload loads on the, the workers they already have. Um, we're going to see more telework in certain sectors, especially in education. Uh, For-profit charter schools are going to uh, push um, telework uh, um remotely streaming classes in order to cut down their own costs and maximize their own profits. And uh, as a result of that, uh, making the quality of education worse, we're going to see um, uh, austerity worsen, especially in the public sector, as Bryn was saying, with cutbacks at universities, even uh, um, workplaces that are not hit as hard by the crisis um, are going to, such as the Postal Service, there's a major major focus on uh, privatizing the Postal Service right now by the Trump administration, which has got to be a focus of the labor movement to fight against. Um, even though they're uh, doing increased business, the, the loss of tax revenue is going to be used as an excuse to, to push the concessions in uh, contract negotiations. And we are also seeing uh, an explosion in certain sectors of the economy, even though generally industries are suffering more, there's certain ones that are um, benefiting from this crisis. Uh, uh, grocery stores, uh, certain tech apps like uh, Zoom um, have have really exploded. And so that's that's a threat, but it's also an opportunity for the labor sector um, to do union drives, to, to organize the unorganized while these things are still uh of a manageable, manageable size. We don't want to let what happened with Amazon happen where it uh, grew out of control and is now this um, massive uh, multinational um, conglomerate that is much more difficult to organize than it would have been when it was smaller, uh, which brings me to other opportunities that we're presented with as a result of this crisis. Uh, one of them being that we can make improvements that we are winning now permanent. A uh, good example of this is uh, bus drivers in Detroit and uh, Birmingham, Alabama, both uh, state strikes in order to um, eliminate collecting fares on their routes, which is something that should have been happening anyway. Um, uh, public transportation should be accessible to all. It should be taxpayer funded. And uh, now that the, those workers have gotten together and uh, struck and um, forced to change and uh, learn from their experience, it's very likely that uh, when the crisis passed and they try to reinstate fares, that the workers can make a stand and um, uh, make that that temporary win permanent. Um, another example being letter carriers in Winnipeg who went on strike to um, eliminate uh, junk mail. They didn't want to um, be handing out junk mail in this crisis. Uh, another thing is that um, it's this crisis is bringing attention to long-standing problems. Um, especially a good example is is the the lack of preparedness in the. Uh, healthcare sector, the lack of uh, basic materials to keep workers safe. Um, this is something that didn't just happen with the crisis. It's something that's been ongoing, but now the world's eyes are focused on it. And um, those workers can use that as leverage uh, in the future. Also, um, it highlights the importance of our public sector and public workers, uh, especially in transportation, uh, sanitation, Um those workers are being uh, held as heroes and uh, their, their importance and their, their vitality, their um, um, how important they are to the econ economy is very clear to the general public, which they can also use as leverage in the future. Uh, so what, 
we really need to be focusing right now is on union drives, on organizing the unorganized um, in a way that we haven't been focusing on uh, as much in recent years. Um, and But we also need to be organized in union shops, uh, which is what we're doing at UPS, um, so that we can set our own terms uh, for a return to work. Uh, the demands that the FRSO has put forward um, in labor are four demands. Number one being that we should close all non-essential workplaces. Um, two, that no worker shall suffer econo- economically from this crisis, uh, whether their job still exists or not. There shouldn't be um, people who are uh, worse off as a result of the crisis, um, whether that's healthcare costs from uh, contracting the virus um, or disruptions to their normal employment. Uh, number three uh, being that uh, every worker who is considered essential uh, be kept safe uh, through sanitation, through uh, uh, personal protective equipment, through reporting all cases of COVID in workplaces, keeping people informed and um, doing everything we can to keep those of us who are having to go out to work every day um, as as safe as possible. And finally, the fourth demand is hazard pay. Those of us who are still uh, working are working in incredibly dangerous conditions. Um, At UPS, uh, the average worker handles hundreds of thousands of boxes a day. The virus can live 24 hours on cardboard, uh, different um, different lengths for different surfaces. Even though uh, those of us who are working inside the, the hub doing, doing warehouse work are not interacting with the public, um, we are uh, still facing great risk there, but not as much as the package car drivers who are still talking to um, dozens of people face-to-face every day um, moving throughout the city. Um, so, so those are the sorts of things we're trying to win. Uh, we are in the early stages of a campaign at UPS. We've handed out some flyers. Um, since handing out uh, the, the flyers that we have initially, uh, we, we provoked a, a response from the boss, and, and we've won uh, some amount of personal protective equipment, um, some new sanitation guidelines. Um, workers now uh, uh, have access to masks in our workplace. Um, so we're focusing uh, more heavily on the hazard pay. Uh, the way we've been doing that, um, the, the flyers we, we, we passed out had a, uh, um, we're calling for a, a call-in to the UPS ethical hotline, which was a new tactic that we're, that we're uh, learning about for the first time. Um, and you can do something similar at your, your workplace uh, if you happen to be in a union. If you're not in a union, um, Organizing is uh, completely different and you're at much greater risk and you're likely the best thing you can do is to organize your workplace to bring a union in, uh, which is beyond the scope of what we're talking about on this stream. Uh, But if you have any questions about that, uh, feel free to to message me. Um, The Teamsters are uh, willing to uh, organize in all sorts of sectors, all sorts of industries. Uh, There might be another union that is uh, better suited for your workplace, uh, but you would reach out to uh, to some unions, uh, uh, find some people who are willing to help you organize, and it's a matter of, of getting a majority of your coworkers on board, and it's something you have to be um, uh, very, very careful with. But for those of us who are in unions um, or do have some other uh, sorts of protections uh, that would allow you to carry out a campaign. Uh, the first thing you always have to do is, is be talking to all of your coworkers all the time and building trust with them. Um, be a person who knows uh, your rights as workers, knows your contract, uh, can intervene and um, uh, help workers who are under threat of, of discipline or harassment from management. Um, in the course of doing that, having those those conversations and and making connections with people, uh, you'll identify particular issues that are especially important in your workplace, whether it's healthcare, childcare, wages, um, any sort of uh, working conditions that that need to be changed. Anything that um, a strong majority of the workforce uh, feels uh, a real felt need, um, and that should be the focus of your campaign. Um, once you've identified that issue, you can start taking actions by passing out flyers, handing out buttons, doing a petition. Right now, um, we, we've done petitions in the past with uh, uh, pen and paper, but um, since that um, isn't the most sanitary 
uh, tactic. Uh, at the moment, we've done we've uh, switched to online p- petitions. Um, you can certainly do marches on the boss and demonstrations outside your workplace. Uh, although um, uh, maintaining social distance and, and doing everything you, you you can to keep people safe in the course of that. Um, in the course of doing that, you're going to identify people. Who, some of your coworkers are, are willing to help you. And those are your advanced, uh, advanced workers. You, you want to identify um, those people in every particular area of your workplace. And your task as an organizer is to unite those people and to organize those people and um, plan and carry out the campaign with those people. So you use the advanced workers to mobilize the intermediate, which is the majority of your uh, workplace. Uh, people who have um, probably a mix of different ideas, um, maybe more or less apathetic. Those are the people you're trying to win over and mobilize towards a specific action. Like I said, uh, in our current campaign, it's calling into the um, UPS ethical hotline. Uh, but um, we, you know, we look at the current conditions as they change and we choose the most effective tactic for, for the moment in a campaign. Um, but you need something for people to do people to call in people to gather people to talk to the bosses, people to wear buttons or um, anything thing you can do to, to, to mobilize the majority of the workforce. And in um, uh, many cases, you're going to have backwards workers, workers with um, reactionary ideas who are actively fighting against your campaign. And by uniting your advanced workers in order to mobilize your intermediate workers, you necessarily socially isolate the backwards workers. And the most important part of any campaign is summation. Um, and that means making sure people are taking, drawing the correct lessons from the campaign as it's taking place, whether it's won or lost. Um, you need to explain um why it was won or lost and um, because the boss is going to be making their own summation with the workers and they're going to say that you're asking for too much or that after you won, that those were reforms that were already, um, uh, they were already planning to carry out. Um, So in in every case, um, all along the way, and especially at the end of the campaign, you need to be doing summation with everyone who participated to make sure that the correct lessons were being drawn from it. And, uh, by doing that, you um, create this this uh, core of workers. We refer to it as the militant minority, people who are willing to fight both the boss and fight back against um, bureaucratic trade unionism and class collaborationism from your, their union leaders. Um, you, you need to uh, constantly be focusing on that militant minority and... Um, mobilizing it and expanding it uh, because that that is the um, central mechanism for um, for doing labor organizing so that you can take your successes of one campaign and uh, use that momentum to take you into the future um, with uh, subsequent campaigns and that's about all I had prepared so I'll toss it back to Teresa All right, thank you, Nick. That was a very lovely presentation. Um, So next we are going to have Mariela Mendoza uh, speaking. Um, They are a longtime activist here in Salt Lake City um, and they are today representing uh, migrant mutual aid as well as Uplift. Um, So give me one moment and I will have Mariela on the screen in just a second. Hello, hello. I hope everybody can hear me this time Um, (laughs) as we are finding our way to this new digital world. We're still trying to figure out how does technology look like right and how do we even continue to connect to each other um, across all of these different barriers. (laughs) So first of all, I'd like to introduce myself. As Teresa mentioned, my name is Mariela Mendoza. I am an undocumented immigrant. I am also the co-director of Uplift, which is a local group that focuses in climate justice organizing from the perspective of youth, as well as connecting 
networks of autonomy here in the Four Corners region. I am also here representing Migrant Mutual Aid Utah. Um, first of all, happy May Day, <laughs> right? What a beautiful day to always remind ourselves that um, it is May Day and that this is a day to call action, to remind ourselves, to remind each other of the struggle of all of the losses that we've had of the past, but also all of our wins. Um, I like to believe that today that the fact that we are even able to connect with each other, that is still a win. We are still winning. We're still connecting. We're still thriving. We're still fighting back. Um, one of the things that I think that this virus has made us very aware of is the way that our enemies are always going to try to put words in our mouths and they're always going to try to define what does catastrophe look like? What does disaster look like? But us as working class people and personally myself as an indigenous descendant people, I know for a fact that climate disaster and disaster in general has been hitting us, the working class for many, many years now, right? Um, you know, even as we recently celebrated 50 years of Earth Day, that's 50 years of Earth Day. What does that mean when there's 500 years over a history of colonization under these colonized lands, right? Um, what does it mean for us to talk about panic and talk about sheltering in place when there's um, relatives that don't have shelter that cannot shelter in place, right? What does it mean for us to um, see all of the things that threaten us, all of the forces that threaten us, and really like look at it through an anti-colonial, um, anti-capitalist point of view and see how the forces of, um, of those who threaten us, of those who try to kill us, have been hitting us again since 1492. So I know for myself, um, speaking for myself and Uplift, um, let me tell y'all a little bit about Uplift, first of all. So my role at Uplift as co-director is fairly new. I'm very, very excited, very nervous um, because it's a big it's a big leap for me as an organizer. As Theresa mentioned, um, I've been an activist here in Salt Lake City, Utah for many years now. And um, to go from being an activist to um, being more in a coordinator role, right? And an organization is very daunting. Um, but for me, what really excites me about Uplift is the, the people, the core team. Um, we are a youth-led organization that has been working here in the Four Corners region for about five years now. Every single year, we put a convergence together where hundreds of young people gather to talk about climate change and climate justice and climate disaster, right? And exactly as that is, right? Not, not trying to frame it as climate change being something outside of, um, of people power or something that does not involve the people, but seeing us as an extension of Mother Earth and what does it mean for us to hold hold capitalism accountable for the harm that has done to Mother Earth and also like hold the corporations that are causing that harm accountable, right? What does that look like? Um, something that I personally really value about Uplift is our leadership is made up of mostly people of color. Myself and my co-director, Lyrica, we're indigenous descendant. So when we're talking about climate disaster and climate catastrophe, we're not just joking around saying things that we read in books. You know, we're not Greta Thunberg. I'm not a little white girl. I'm here representing my people, representing my community, that is always on the front lines, honestly, of these disasters. Um, as Bryn mentioned, um, we have a lot of different communities that are always impacted by these disasters, always impacted by here in Salt Lake City, by these refineries, by the inversion. And it's no coincidence that it's always the same fucking communities that are under these disasters, you know, that is not... Um, yeah, that's that's we we know how to connect the dots. We know how to um, put these things together, and we see it. We see who's guilty, and um, honestly, like we're watching them, right? We're watching you, motherfuckers, um, and that's why we're gathering together year after year. Um, that's why we build. That's why everything that we do, everything that Uplift does, we don't even run our own campaigns. What we really like to do is we just like to go look for where the roots are in the region, go towards where all of the people are building and really just connect those folks and help out in whichever way we can. We're more of a training camp than anything. Um, and I'm really humbled and blessed to be in that role, if that makes sense. Um, another organization that I really want to highlight right now is Migrant Mutual Aid Utah, for which I am their volunteer coordinator. 
And Migrant Mutual Aid Utah got started because me and my homegirl, I straight up, I lost my job. I used to work in a restaurant. Um, they let me go without even a warning. They just asked me to not come back. Um, at first, they asked me to not come back after a week. Then a week passed by and they were like, can you just stay home for another week? And then they sent me a $50 gift card and haven't been contacted since. Um, so I have not heard from that restaurant since then. So on the day that that happened, I hit up my homegirl and she was telling me like, yo, same, um, my mom, her comadres, you know, all of these women in West Valley, they're telling us the exact same story. What do we do? And so we mobilized and within 48 hours, we had started a signal group that later has now become Migrant Mutual Aid Utah. Um, I'm happy to report that to the day we have gathered over $10,000 for Migrant Mutual Aid Utah. We have been spreading the word, contacting people. That means several families that are getting aid right now, right? And um, just like Uplift, Migrant Mutual Aid Utah is autonomous led, autonomous run. All of our decisions are made in group. Um, both both the organizations I'm with, we're just um, we're not a, we're not 501c3s. We're under fiscal sponsorship. So what that means is that really, like all of the money that we're getting, we really are just pumping it back out into the people. Um, and that's to me really humbling <laughs> and really exciting, right? That um, the the fast turnaround of mutual aid that has been formed here, um, not just here in Salt Lake City, not even just in the Four Corners region, right? But it's happening everywhere. Um, <laughs> sorry, that was a lot of information. Um, <laughs> whew, what else? I guess um, yeah, I'm just here because I I miss y'all. <laughs> I miss going to the protests. I miss seeing all of your sweet faces. I miss bicycling around Salt Lake City with y'all. Um, I miss doing the proud voice with y'all. <laughs> and um, I know that um, in this moment, this might seem very, very daunting, very scary, but I know that, um, you know, I see y'all. I'm literally like witnessing all of y'all's strength, all of y'all's um, yeah, honestly, like straight up strength and adversity um, in this wild ass times, right? That is 2020. Um, and I know that we're strong and I know that we're part of a beautiful community of our sisters and that's what makes us so powerful. Um, yeah, that's mostly what I wanted to say is just that um, I am here, um, we are here and that we are blessed and grateful to be a part of y'all's community and that um, we see y'all in the struggle and solidarity always, camaradas. All right, thank you so much, Mariella. That was an incredible speech. I actually haven't heard a lot about all the stuff that you've been doing. I've just been hearing a little bit, but that was really good to hear. And it was really good to see your face after it's been a second, you know? Um, so the next thing we have is um, a five minute video um, from um, God, the Fronte Popular organization. It's a Italian communist party. Um, they made a solidarity video and sent it to Freedom Road Socialist Organization. Um, and it's very, it's very lovely. So I will get that all set up. Dear comrades of the Freedom Road Socialist Organization, in the behalf of Fronte Popolare of Italy, we salute you and your people in this International Workers' Day. We urge to express our deep solidarity for the current suffering due to the COVID-19 outbreak in your country. By denying the issue or blaming others, Trump's criminal administration has put first capital's profit rather than health and well-being, now resulting in a massive infection and thousands of deaths. We stand on your side in your struggle to overturn the capitalistic class in the country in which it has reached the most advanced form of economic, social, and political organization. Once again, we clearly see that the US working class, its pride, strength, and aspirations is among the most vital threats 
to the worldwide capitalism toward the future of democracy, peace, and socialism. COVID-19 disease has firstly beaten Italy. In a few weeks, we recorded thousands of infected people and dead. The virus has quickly spread in the workplaces and public transport. It nests in hospitals. Many lives could have been spared with a more democratic economic system, able to answer to the need of people rather than private profit, able to adequately fund our health system. The lack of productive gear and the shortage of health employees has turned into an intolerable death tool among medical workers. The private and local management of entire branches of our health system has put in mortal danger our elders, causing thousands to die alone and without dignity. We will not forget. Now that the epidemic curve is flattening, the government is planning to end the quarantine for the most important economic branches by May the 4th. This means that millions of workers are about to get back into factory. Without the right prudence, there is a substantial risk of a new dramatic wave of infection. Last week, the government, together with unions and employers, agreed over a series of safety measures to be taken in, in the workplaces. As Marxists, we know that there is one issue that continues to be neglected in this crisis, that is the centrality of labor in social life. The entire social wealth is produced by labor. Labor creates the wage and the profit and the state budget. Everything depends on the vitality of the productive factory which in turn depends on human activity. Then our claim is that only workers themselves can guarantee the strict respect of the agreement signed by the government, check its adequacy and propose its modifications. Workers must exercise a power of command over their own activity to safeguard their own health in the workplace. In the crisis, we must fight to get this power legally recognized by the state. Therefore, Fronte Popolare is demanding that, to protect those who guarantee our ability to deal with and overcome the COVID-19 emergency, the workers' representative must be entrusted with control power. This power must include functions of reorganization of production activities and the possibility of sanctions against non-compliant employers. We say this explicitly. We are promoting an issue that concerns power and, as such, looks at the very nature of capitalistic relations. We are demanding something that neither the employers nor the political representative will ever be willing to concede. Started immediately, we must ease or directly organize local committees of workers. The primary goals must be that of publicly report employers' abuses or health tricks and explicitly promote changes in the workplaces seeking solidarity among the broad population. Labour is facing an historic opportunity to claim its leading role in the world society. We must not allow the capitalistic class to impose responses in its own exclusive interests, not now, nor in the future economic downturn. The International Workers' Day is a day of the working class pride. We celebrate the leading role of the workers from all over the world in the struggle against the virus, as they once more became aware and more confident of their strength. When we cover the same road, we relentlessly work for a future of democracy and socialism. <laughs>
right now, for example, I'm learning how to use live stream. Um, I don't think I've learned it, but I'm learning. <laughs> so um, I, I would love to hear some other things um, that other people have been learning. So I'm going to... You guys can just raise your hand if you want to respond. Okay, I see Bryn. Okay. Hey, everybody. Um, hey, everybody. Um, yeah, so one of the things... Sorry. <laughs> All right, Therese, full confession, Teresa and I are... are Okay, so I don't know if anybody heard all that, so I'm just going to start again. All right, first of all, car protests. I think that car protests are super awesome, and um, I know people have been doing that in Michigan and just in Salt Lake City a week ago. Um, it's a great way to do an in-person protest, um, like uh, social distance, right? And um, people have been doing this at jails, for instance, or at like people's houses. Like People have gone to their governor's mansions and just been like, are protesting, which is fucking awesome. Um, another thing that I've tried to do is just be a little bit more aware of what people are saying on social media. So for, uh, for example, there have been, um, there's like, uh, in my school for student organizing, there's class of 2020, uh, Facebook groups or class of 2021, whatever. Um, so I have just tried to join those groups and just see what people are saying. And then also like if we're doing a call in or an email in, I'll post there. And I know that in the past, people have done kind of the same thing with Reddit. Um, but I think it's just really important to be a little bit more plugged into social media now that we can't uh, talk to people face to face. Um, but also just like being as creative as we can and just like doing stuff like car protests and doing, I know the uh, UPSers, uh, Teamsters actually, um, at UPS in Florida, I think they've also done in-person protests and they've just stood six feet apart. So I think, um, we just, we just got to keep getting out there and just keep doing what we were doing, but just make sure that we're safe. So that's all I have. I want to point out is that even though we have um, 
we have social media to connect with, right? A lot of us are seeing that there is a need to build our own digital infrastructure so that way we can find ways to organize outside of the system, especially because we're seeing reports of like the way that Zoom um, sometimes violates privacy, right? And um, even though people are say, keep saying use Jitsi instead of Zoom, well, Jitsi, Jitsi doesn't have that great of a connection, right? Um, so what does it mean for us to effectively build and strategize outside of the system? So I think for a lot of us, what that's going to look like is, um, yeah, we're going to have to get tech savvy. We're going to have to start organizing, um, looking outside of the box and, um, yeah, really, really like talking to our comrades. I think something too that is being very visible in this moment, right, is um, especially from a climate justice perspective, we're seeing a lot of eco-fascist um, narratives spring up of um, people saying that this virus is telling us that humans are not needed, right? And it's that kind of disposable narrative that is really um, encouraging folks to forget about the most marginalized um, and criminalized communities, right? So even um, pen and paper, you know, writing to prisoners, um, especially those jails that are still able to receive letters, you know, it's really important. It's critical for us to do that right now um, because our comrades need, need us all over. Okay, thank you. wing it um yeah well i just want to thank everyone for for uh joining the live stream um yeah definitely sound in with, with uh, uh questions in the comments if you have any um but this uh yeah just want to ex extend my uh solidarity to everybody this is a very difficult very trying time um but it's uh definitely a potentially revolutionary moment uh you know, Lenin gave three preconditions for um, for revolution: that the masses cannot live in the old way, that the rulers cannot rule in the old way, and that there exists a revolutionary party. And we're certainly seeing the first two of, of those conditions uh, filled. Um, life is never going back to normal, um, even though it, we're we're not going to be in lockdown forever. Uh, there is life before, and there is life after COVID. And uh, such a sudden and novel and disruptive event is something that is going to be seized upon by uh, the capital class to advance their own interests, stuff that they may not have been able to get away with normally. They're, be, they're going to try to push now. But um, we're also seeing uh, so much militancy and resistance from uh, working people. Um, the, the process of opening back up could uh, definitely cause a lot of worker unrest and might result in a... Um, uh, de facto general strike in a sense. Um, we're seeing uh, unemployment numbers that are approaching uh, Great Depression levels and may exceed them. Um, and we need to look back to the strategies and tactics of the 1930s that uh, brought the, the labor movement and uh, national, libera li national liberation movements uh, to uh, a new level of struggle. And we need to learn lessons of the past in order to um, face the present moment. I just realized my sound was off. Okay. Um, so um, I'm just going to ask one last question. Um, just kind of like where people see the next um, year 
going, um, if people have any goals or hopes, um, and kind of like, where do we see ourselves hopefully in like next May Day? I mean, we can't, you know, predict the future, but like, you know, I think I like to have goals personally as an organizer. Um, so I was, I was just interested what other people are thinking about in terms of the future. Okay. Let's see. Anyone want to answer that one? Brian? Okay. Give me one second. I'm going to do this. All right. So in terms of like goals for the next year, um, I think right now it's really important to stay active. Um, first of all, because if you're not active, like nobody's going to come help you do whatever you're doing. So we just got to make sure that we stay active and keep organizing. Um, and I think like for me, my goals would be to just like not to use this word lightly, but to capitalize on people's total like disillusionment with the system um, and to get them to also start organizing. Cause I think that's really important that we need, like we have so many people right now who are finally seeing like how absolutely shitty things are. Um, and this is the time to bring them in and to, to organize people. So that's what I want. I want to have like, personally, I want to see like SDS get bigger. Um, and so that means that we're going to have to change our tactics again, because usually, you know, people come to our meetings in person um, and that might mean bringing different systems to get people onto our like online virtual meetings. But um, I think I think now is the time to bring people in and to stay active because um, there's going to be a lot of stuff coming our way. And uh, first of all, we're going to have to fight it. And second of all, we're going to have to get new comrades. That's what I want. Just like a bigger, bigger SDS next year. Um, so I'd say it's really important to, uh, be thinking towards the future and the possible scenarios. I think most likely we're going to be seeing a uh, relaxation of uh, lockdown rules this summer, um, followed by a second wave of COVID in the fall um, and probably uh, return some stricter measures. Um, this thing is not going to be controlled until a vaccine is developed, which may be a year or a year and a half away. Um, and, uh, so it, there, there, there is some possibility we'll be doing more, uh, virtual meetings like this, e even in the next year. Um, so it's really important to rapidly adapt, uh, to the new conditions to be able to, um, seize the current moment and, um, uh, like I said initially, to, to return to work uh, on our own terms. Um, there's, it, it's uh, it's an incredibly dynamic situation, something totally un unprecedented in world history. And so there's more need than ever for uh, dedicated organizers uh, working together um, in, uh, in organizations to uh, advance our agenda. And if you're listening to this and you um, haven't yet made that leap of uh, making the decision to become a, a full-time activist, a professional revolutionary, um, if uh, you haven't linked up with coworkers or community organizations, uh, now is absolutely the time to do it. Um, it's, it's a very critical moment, um, and it's what we do right now that is going to determine whether we gain or lose ground and what kind of world we were living in on the other side of this. Um, great. As far as, um, well, speaking of for both organizations that I'm affiliated with, right, on both Uplift and Migrant Mutual Aid Utah, 
Um, we have a very similar approach to what does returning to normal mean, mean, right? When there is no such thing as return to normal, as well as planning ahead when there is no such thing as, right? Like you, you can't, you can't plan for cer certain things. Um, and we are both, I, I think, very um, similar in that we are moving forward at the speed of trust. We are moving forward at the speed of capacity. We're moving forward at the speed of community and that our goals align with that. They align with um, building sustainable futures, sustainable autonomous um, movements that involve people building capacity by and for each other, right? As a Four Corners region, um, base groups we know that there's a lot of wisdom in our region right um you can see it when you just walk around you can see the land you can see the sage brushes coming up to say hello you can see the little seedlings you can feel the wind here in the desert mountains region and um it's always a reminder right that um again for us building power and building momentum doesn't come from a singular organism it comes from multiple organisms collaborating together and building that sustainability with each other so whether it be via um, networks of mutual aid that are emphasizing on a criminalized identity such as that is being an undocumented immigrant or whether they be networks that are working with one of the most impacted regions right the Navajo Nation right now um, our commitment is centered on making sure that those networks are staying alive staying sustainable staying connected um because to the to us that's that's what comes first we see our neighbors we know that not everybody has access to internet in the res we know that not everybody has access to clean water in the res um so for us our commitment to the rural communities most impacted the marginalized communities most impacted is is what's carrying us into the future and um yeah we hope to only get, get bigger and stronger but at the same time, we're we're grateful and humbled to be alive, um, even in our little seedling stage. <laughs> okay. All right. So thank you guys for answering all that. Um, and I believe this is. Teresa, I think you're muted. Oh, I'm muted. Ah, shit. Ah, damn it. Oh, I am muted. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. One second. Ah, jeez. Okay. Okay. Um. Okay. Okay, so this is the end of our panel. Um, I'd just like to thank all the panelists for coming on. I really appreciate it. Um, and I will be linking some stuff related to just like the history of May Day um, after I'm done with this. And yeah, um, if any, yeah, and anyone has any questions, feel free to DM the Freedom Road Socialist Organization Salt Lake City page. Um, yeah, again, thank you guys so much for watching. Um, stay safe um, and continue the struggle. Okay.